Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Cindy Specht, Executive Vice President of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, the leading peer-directed national organization focusing on the two most prevalent mental health conditions, depression and bipolar disorder. Thank you for joining DVSA and our esteemed presenters for today's webinar on restoring intimacy. Depression and bipolar disorder pose a challenge not just to our health, but to our closest relationships as well. Today's webinar takes a realistic look at these challenges, as well as practical ways to make intimate relationships work for people living with or affected by mood disorders. Before we begin, I'd like to orient everyone on the flow for today's webinar and share some logistics. Today's webinar is broken into three parts. Dr. Clayton's presentation on the nature, cause, and effect of the interplay of mood disorders and intimacy. Dr. Schwartz's presentation on effective communication strategies for discussion with your clinicians and partner and a 20 to 30 minute open Q&A. All audience members will be on mute for the duration of this webinar. However, we will be accepting written questions throughout the webinar and providing answers after Dr. Schwartz's presentation. To submit your question, type it into the chat box on your screen and hit enter on your keyboard or mouse click on the, on the submit button. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our two esteemed presenters, Dr. Anita Clayton and Dr. Holly Schwartz. Presenting later will be Holly A. Schwartz, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, where she is the Medical Director of the Depression and Manic Depression Prevention Program. She is well known for her work in evaluating interpersonal psychotherapy and interpersonal and social rhythm therapy as treatments for depression and bipolar disorder. Dr. Schwartz's research focuses on understanding and optimizing psychosocial and pharmacological interventions for mood disorders. Now I'm honored to introduce our first presenter, Anita Clayton. Dr. Clayton is Interim Chair, Department of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences, David C. Wilson Professor of Psychiatry, and Professor of Clinical Obstetrics and Gyneco Gynecology at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Anita Clayton's research has melded women's mental health and sexual function, primarily involving mood disorders associated with reproductive life events in women, sexual dysfunction related to illness and medications, and treatment of sexual disorders. Her current clinical research projects involve potential new treatments for hypoactive sexual desire disorder, sexual arousal disorder, orgasmic disorder, antidepressant induced sexual dysfunction, and major depressive disorder. I now give you Dr. Anita Clayton. Thank you, Cindy. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, sort of normal sex or sexual health and how we might be um, expecting life to occur, but then I will also talk about the kinds of things that might get in the way of having a satisfying sexual life. And then as you see here in the overview, um, Holly will be talking, Dr. Schwartz will be talking about barriers that need to be overcome and how that might occur. Sexual health is defined by the World Health Organization as a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. It's not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. Sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and to sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. For sexual health to be attained and maintained, the sexual rights of all persons must be respected, protected, and fulfilled. So we'll, we really want sexual health. But sex is a pretty complicated endeavor, even though it might seem basically simple because we manage to participate in it without a lot of education. It's, it's really a complex interaction of a variety of factors, and I'd like to start with the tiniest factor in terms of its scale uh, in life, and that is biology. Genetics, which are on the level of DNA, um, subcellular function, so things like hormones and neurotransmitters, and then uh, actions that occur at the level of a basic structure, for example, in the brain, and then the interaction of those structures in a network or throughout the whole body. 
also substances, whether they're prescribed substances, or illicit substances, or, or legal substances, may impact on our biology as well. So if our biology is operating, our brain is operating because the structure is intact, then the process that results from that is the mind. And that's where psychology or intrapsychic, what's going on in a single person's uh, thoughts, may also be impaired. And that might be related to things like uh, problems with self-image, a past history of abuse or trauma, uh, depressed or anxious mood, and other thoughts that are going on in an individual's own uh, processing. Then that individual interacts with another individual. That is, if they want to have partnered sex, and that's then on an interpersonal level. What's going on between those two or more individuals? And so the things that might be involved there would be the nature of the relationship, availability of a partner in terms of partnered sex, um, a history of abstinence, and other life stressors. And then finally, the individual and the two individuals involved in the relationship may have uh, effects as a result of sociocultural factors. So things like what your family has taught you about sexuality uh, or other important individuals in your life, their teachings, religious norms which tend to be restrictive, cultural norms which in the U.S. are often restrictive, and what expectations our culture has of us with regard to sex or where and when sex might be allowed is the sociocultural factors involved. So you can see these are all overlapping, they're all important, um, and they build from that basic subcellular to our entire society. Now, one of the things you might want to do is think about what, which of these models is true for you at this time. Which of these models best represents your sexual response? Be aware that your sexual response might change over time as we get older or if the nature of our relationship changes or something like that. But if you think about which response seems most appropriate for you right now, that may be helpful in thinking through some of the other factors later. Uh, Masters and Johnson, who you might have heard of, uh, were sex researchers, basically, and they designed uh, a model that they gained from watching people, and this started with arousal. So it started with already being stimulated. You, the people would get aroused, there was sort of a plateau there, and ultimately they would reach a peak of orgasm and then have resolution. So for men, that resolution involved a refractory period. For women who might be multi-orgasmic, uh, there really wasn't a refractory period after that. Helen Singer Kaplan, a psychiatrist, added the concept of sexual desire, that is sort of a spontaneous desire. You think about sex, you think you might want sex, and um, you have motivated behaviors to get you into a position where you might be able to have sex, if it's appropriate at that time. She then thought, once you were involved in sex, that this linear model uh, was a, a good explanation for what she saw in her practice. And then, more recently, Rosemary Besson has described a circular model that basically involves participating in sexual activity for reasons other than the physical pleasure related to sex. So it might be related to emotional intimacy that, you, that someone with this um, model rep, as a good representative of their, of their sexuality might participate in sex for, but they also might participate out of obligation or so their partner doesn't seek out someone else um, or for other reasons not related to sexual pleasure. So think about if any of these apply to you. In, in some recent studies, about 15% of people said none of these models applied to them. Uh, another way of thinking about those factors that I talked about, either um, neurotransmitters, endocrine, uh, hormones, uh, psychosocial or cultural factors, interpersonal factors, they all have a role in whether we see you getting excited or whether we see inhibition of excitement. So it might be that you see somebody attractive that you're close to and um, you participated in sex with that person before and you think I want to have sex with them, but you're on a, a subway 
and there's a lot of other people on the subway, and so culturally it wouldn't be appropriate to, to participate right then. So that might be an inhibitor or a turning off of the factors that previously had you feeling turned on. So this is a dynamic process, and that at different times we see excitement or inhibition. Now there are other uh, sociocultural factors that play a role in sexual satisfaction, and sexual satisfaction is very important. So it's not just the process of uh, sexual response, but a result of that might be sexual satisfaction. Some factors that influence this are things like gender expectations, so sometimes there are different expectations for and by men versus for and by women. Uh, religious beliefs may also play a role, so if you have a religious prohibition against sexual activity before you're married and you participate uh, in that activity, then you might feel guilty about that and have reduced sexual satisfaction. Your family may influence it. If your mother said, oh gosh, I just have sex to keep your dad quiet, um, then that might influence what you think about sex. There are uh, various uh, types of societies in terms of sexual, their sort of sexual view. Um, Asian societies, for example, are more male focused or reproductive focused, and that may influence satisfaction. Those societies appear to have less sexual satisfaction from both men and women versus partner-centered societies like we see in the U.S. Uh, where there's a focus on also pleasing your partner and having sex not just for reproductive purposes. And then the media really plays a role in our sense of our, our own sexuality and who we are as sexual beings. Um, we, when we look at the media, it seems very obsessed with physical appearance, and this is true more for women than men. I don't know if you heard uh, a, uh, a talk show host in Australia, a, a man talk show host wore the same suit every day for a year because they had commented about what his woman co-host was wearing and had been critical of her and he did no one noticed and so he did this to show that people pay attention to what women wear or how they look and much less so about what men are wearing and how they look. Usually though when we see things in the media about sex and sexuality we tend to think we're lacking. I, I have this thing wrong with my body, or I don't like this about myself. And we also tend to think that everyone has more and better sex than we do. But don't believe it. It's not really true. And the sexiest looking people by our, our values are not necessarily the people having the best sex. Sometimes we have personal dissatisfaction with our sexual lives because we put sex as a low priority. That it might be that you're a single parent, you're taking, you have a job, you're taking care of children, you've got to take care of the home and everything else you've got to do, and so sex goes low on the priority list. Sometimes stress, too, plays a role in terms of dissatisfaction. If we're having trouble at work, we might bring that home, and that might influence our desire to participate in sex or our response. And sometimes we don't use strategies like exercise, for example, or other good healthy lifestyles that can help us with uh, feeling more satisfied with sexual activity. Also, sometimes we have unreasonable expectations, like um, you know we should be swinging from the chandeliers with every sexual activity, or that, um, that we have a concern that we might not please our partner and have performance anxiety. So those might also lead to dissatisfaction. In these settings, failure to communicate about what we want and what we like or what we don't like can often cause problems. And sometimes we hold back because we think if we tell our partner you don't like this that they're doing or you would prefer if they did that, that they might uh, be offended or hurt. But this limits honesty. It means that the person who's not telling might be carrying around frustration and resentment. Um, it may hurt the relationship, especially if these issues come out later, so communication can be very important, and you're going to hear about that later. Relationship issues are not always a sexual problem. For example, there's almost always a difference in the level of desire between two partners in an ongoing relationship. One has more desire than the other, um, and it doesn't mean that the person with less desire has a problem. It just means that there's a slight discrepancy between the desire of those two individuals. And so communication and trying to work that out may be helpful. 
also be aware that the longer, statistics show that the longer we're in a relationship, the less frequently we participate in sexual activity. It doesn't mean that the sex is not as good uh, when we do have it, but it does seem that we tend to reduce the frequency over time. And then periods of abstinence, for example, if your partner is uh, uh, active duty out of the country or uh, you have to travel or you uh, are maintaining a long distance relationship uh, with someone because you're away at school, those kinds of things, uh, periods of abstinence can contribute to um, awkwardness uh, when you return or concerns about your own participation in sex when uh, you're able to then uh, not you, when you have your partner available and, and you're not having abstinence. So keep that in mind if you've had uh, a period of time in which you've not been participating or not been able to participate in sex. One thing to think about is that depression may be one of those things that causes you to be more socially isolated, not as interested in things, and so might lead to some periods of essentially abstinence. A lot of data shows that sex is important to the quality of life, and that's true regardless of gender, uh, sexual orientation, social status, etc. And this is a circular pattern. The happier people feel, the more likely they are to want to engage in sexual activity, and doing so improves their mood, and so they feel happier, and then they're more likely to want to engage in sex. Now, I'd like to define a few things that are related to problems with sexual activity. Um, because we've talked about sort of sexual health and what might be uh, a satisfying sexual life, but there may be problems that arise depending on a lot of factors. A sexual complaint is really just an expression of discontent related to one of the phases of the sexual response cycle or an expression of sexual pain. It might have occurred once. It might have been very mild or minor. Um, you might just be complaining about it to your partner or to your best friend or some other uh, individual, and it doesn't really mean that there's any ongoing problems or difficulties. Sexual dysfunction, on the other hand, is having a sexual complaint plus having distress about it. So very often distress is associated either with a more severe problem or with an ongoing problem that's been a, a, difficult, a difficulty that's gone on for weeks or months. And a sexual disorder, as defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, is persistent or recurrent complaint, which causes personal distress and isn't better explained by some other factor, like having depression or being on an antidepressant therapy or having diabetes. And we're going to talk about some of these factors because very often the conditions we're talking about are associated frequently with comorbid medical conditions or the, the medications we use to treat those medical conditions or the mental health problems may contribute to problems with sexual function as well. Now, when we look at women's sexual complaints, this was a study done a while ago um, in, uh, by a sociologist and looking at the general population of women between 18 and 59 years of age. They interviewed over 1,700 women and they found that about 43% of them had a sexual complaint that we talked about before, an expression of discontent or pain. When they broke it down, they found that about a third had a complaint that they had low sexual interest or desire, about a quarter were unable to achieve orgasm, and about one-fifth had pain during sex. Looking at the men, data from uh, this same study were used also, and that involved 1,250 men, also ages 18 to 59, and then a couple other studies that looked at um, uh, one out of Australia and one out of the UK um, looked at over 2,100 additional men. And what they found was that a significant percentage of men, about 15 percent, lacked interest. That's about half of what we saw from women, but it's still a significant percentage. So don't let anyone tell you that because you're a man, you just have an interest in sex all the time. That isn't true. It can be very isolating to hear that. And you can see about 15% of men lack sexual interest as a, as a complaint. Um, you can see it's a wide range who feel they climax too early. And some of this might be about wanting to please their partner. 
uh, because when you really look at premature ejaculation rates, that is as measured by um, having um, an orgasm within a minute of penetration, it's somewhere between 1 and 3 percent. So uh, men's perception of climaxing too early probably has more to do with their partner than with the actual timing. And then erectile dysfunction occurs in 20 to 50 percent of men. This tends to increase as men get older and is associated with medical conditions like cardiovascular disease. And then almost one in five men have performance anxiety. You know, am I going to get an erection? Am I going to please my partner? Am I going to last long enough? Is my technique any good? So these are concerns that men tend to have uh, more than women. And, and so you see these numbers here, one in five. Now if we start to talk about depression and sexual functioning, there's a lot of overlap among a variety of factors that might make it difficult for us to figure out exactly what is contributing to the problem with sexual functioning in a particular individual. So sexual dysfunction could be a symptom of the depressive illness. It could be an effect of antidepressant medication. It could be an effect of another condition, either a medical condition, a psychiatric condition, or a sexual condition. It could be the effect of a substance like prescribed medications, over-the-counter medications, illicit drugs, or legal drugs like uh, smoking cigarettes, nicotine. And it could be related to a secondary effect on social or intimate relationships. When people are depressed, they lose interest, they socially isolate, and that may impact negatively on the relationship and therefore impact on sex. When we start to look at the impact of depression or the overlap of depression with sexual functioning, we have some good data with regard to women. This was a very large study that involved 50,000 women, 63% of whom responded uh, to the survey. And you can see that they had an expression of sexual complaint or problem of about 44% when you talked about any dysfunction, very similar to what I told you about in the Lawman study. You can see other numbers there between 20 and almost 40 percent for the specific sexual complaint. But if you add distress about it, that is, this is a problem that is now bothering them, you can see the numbers go way down. And the most common problem in women is uh, low sexual desire at about 10 percent and about 5 percent of women with arousal and orgasm problems plus distress. If you, uh, in, a, in this study, Women who reported these issues with sexual problems and their distress also were asked about had they ever been diagnosed with depression, were they being actively treated with medications for depression, and they were measured for symptoms of depression that were untreated. And about 40% of the women in the study had uh, depression or had had depression or were being treated for depression. So depression is the most common comorbid condition with a sexual dysfunction and so needs to be ruled out because if that is a problem we need to treat the depression and hopefully not with something that's going to further contribute to the sexual dysfunction. And it, this relationship goes in both directions. This was a meta-analysis that is looking at all the literature and try, that's been published in trying to put this together and what they found was that if you have depression then the likelihood you have of developing sexual dysfunction is increased 50 to 70 percent. But if you have a sexual problem, a sexual dysfunction first, the likelihood of developing depression is three times greater than the other way around. So 130 to 210 percent increased risk of developing depression. So if someone has a sexual dysfunction, we should be looking at potential problems with um, depression, but also if they have depression, they're very likely to go on and have sexual dysfunction. The STAR-D study, which some of you may know about, was looking at depression and algorithmic treatment for it, trying to figure out how do we treat people if they don't respond to the initial treatment or the second treatment. And what they found was that treating patients in that study who were depressed with antidepressant therapy, because very few people got um, psychotherapy, uh, in this in this study, treating the patients with depression actually improved their sexual functioning and their sexual satisfaction. Um, sexual dysfunction 
associated with the use of antidepressant medications in other studies has been found to reduce self-esteem and quality of life in press and, and put a significant burden on interpersonal relationships. So we want to treat depression, identify it, but not further contribute to the problem. Other illnesses that contribute to sexual uh, functioning difficulties are other kinds of mood disorders, uh, so bi bipolar illness, for example, anxiety disorders, psychotic illnesses, eating disorders, PTSD, and not just PTSD associated with sexual trauma, cardiovascular disease, because that impacts on the vasculature, which influences mostly um, genital responses, neurological disorders, which is going to impact uh, on the brain and peripheral ner uh, nerves. Uh, Urogyne problems or urological problems are the end organ related to sex, and so diseases there may contribute to sexual problems. And endocrine disorders also significantly contribute. Also, other chronic illnesses that we might not think about um, might cause a problem because um, treatment for cancer may in fact lead to sexual dysfunction with the treatment itself or it may lead to body image problems. And, and problems like rheumatoid arthritis might lead to um, physical restrictions on what you can actually participate in or the kinds of positions you might be able to get in for sexual activity. And then, of course, the meds we use to treat a lot of these conditions further contribute. So many of the antidepressants, mood stabilizers such as lithium, antipsychotic medications, benzodiazepines, and anti-epileptic drugs, many of which are used as mood stabilizers, may all contribute to problems with sexual functioning. There may be some differences among those, um, and those might be something to talk about with your provider. Blood pressure medicines, the older we get, most of us end up having problems with blood pressure. Those may contribute to problems. If you need to take something for your cholesterol, that might contribute to problems. Taking oral contraceptives might contribute. And being on narcotics, using antihistamines, or taking over-the-counter pain medicines like ibuprofen may also contribute if you do that on a regular daily basis. Also, it's hard to talk about sex. Um, in a, this was a study done in Spain where the doctors looked for the patients to spontaneously tell them about sexual dysfunction that they were experiencing with their antidepressant therapy. And they found that only 14% of the people told them about it when they had to bring it up. When they then, the doctors then administered a validated scale to measure that problem, so it gave the patients permission to talk about it in a way that was going to be helpful to their provider. Then they found that they got a four-fold increase in the percentage of people reporting these problems in the same visit. So open communication with your provider is very important. But if your doctor doesn't bring it up, you ought to. When we look at antidepressant-associated sexual dysfunction, we've used a questionnaire that I developed many years ago called the Changes in Sexual Function Questionnaire. And in looking at SSRIs or serotonin reuptake inhibitors, whether there's norepinephrine reuptake inhibitory effects or not, about 35% of people, or just over a third, had significant sexual dysfunction. And there were no gender differences. So men and women both experienced sexual dysfunction uh, because of their antidepressant. And looking at uh, the people who didn't meet the overall criteria for sexual dysfunction and just looking at uh, single phases of the sexual response cycle, over 95% had some impairment, either in their level of desire, in their ability to be aroused, in their orgasmic function, uh, or in their satisfaction. And men were more likely than women to have desire or orgasmic dysfunction in that study, and women were more likely to have arousal dysfunction, but both genders had problems in all those areas. These are the cutoff scores for the CSFQ, and you should have the changes in sexual function questionnaire there available to you um, to fill out, and so you could complete that and then score it using this. What you're really looking for initially is the total score, uh, which is less than or equal to 47 in men and less than or equal to 41 in women indicates sexual um, dysfunction. And uh, then you might look at the specific phases to see what might be targeted by your provider to, to be helpful. 
one of the reasons that we need to address this issue is because a lot of people don't take their medications as prescribed when they have sexual dysfunction associated uh, with their treatment. So you can see in this study, two different sexual problems were in the top five reasons for people not taking their medications as prescribed couldn't have an orgasm and lost their sex drive. And then for people actually just stopping taking their medicine, saying, I'm not going to take this anymore, losing their sex drive was in the top five. So talking about it with your provider could uh, be a way in which you might be able to have changes or some kind of management or adaptation that would allow you to continue to take a medication for treatment of depression but not experience sexual dysfunction. So general management options. Talk to your provider. Your provider should maximize interventions to reduce the effects of the, of the disease or disorder. So to treat the depression, to treat the diabetes effectively, uh, to treat your thyroid problems, whatever that might be. And eliminating or reducing contributing factors may also play a role. So alcohol can have a negative effect on sexual function, as can uh, illicit substances. Smoking does too. Um, various medications may contribute, and if your partner has sexual dysfunction, that usually causes you a problem with your sexual function or activity. Exercise, on the other hand, can help improve sexual function, and eating uh, well, uh, having a healthy uh, diet may also further improve your sexual functioning. Communication and discussion really needs to also involve your sexual partner. Uh, it may mean that you can figure out alternative positions that are better for you or use of sex toys or some other things um, or working on the relationship uh, because your partner is probably very likely uh, to potentially blame themselves for what uh, seems to be a problem in the relationship and talking about it can be reassuring and uh, allow both of you to, to move forward together. And then there are specific interventions. Um, like certain types of psychotherapy for very specific problems or acupuncture may even be uh, helpful, uh, but many of these are not always available to everyone. So I'm going to stop there and uh, it will go to Holly Schwartz now and who will talk with you about uh, some of the issues related with communication and barriers. Oops, I missed that. Uh, these are some of the strategies for, sorry, before we go, these are some of the strategies for managing sexual dysfunction uh, due to, to medications. So you can wait for it to go away, which works in about 5 to 10 percent of people in about 4 to 6 months. You can lower the dose, but that might lead to relapse of the illness the medication was used to treat. Going without your medicine for a few days may um, reduce the effect of the medication, but you can have a relapse of your illness or discontinuation symptoms from not taking your medicines. Um, your doctor could replace the medicine that's causing the problem with something else that works in a slightly different way, but to treat the same problem. But sometimes you get different side effects and sometimes people are afraid that now this new medicine won't work. Or your provider might add in antidotes that uh, would counteract the sexual side effects and these can be helpful, although you may have the increased cost of another uh, prescription and increased side effects as well. Is that my last slide? I think so. So Cindy, can you transfer this to Holly? It looks like I might already have it. Let me okay, see. Okay, good. Yeah, okay, great. Um, all right, well, thank you, Dr. Clayton. Uh, I'm Holly Swartz, and uh, I'm going to be focusing on having conversations about sex and intimacy, both with your healthcare providers and with your partner. Um, and let's see if I can get the slides working. Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, this sometimes can be a difficult conversation for us to have. 
Um, and I want to focus first on having that conversation with our health care providers. Uh, so why might this be a hard uh, conversation uh, to engage in? Well, first of all, um, this is an interesting study. This is a study that was done um, as a web-based survey with over um, almost 4,000 women um, about uh, uh, difficulties that uh, they had bringing up uh, their concerns about their sexual functioning with their health care providers. And what you can see here is that more than half um, of the women that were surveyed said that they, they didn't think that their health care providers wanted to hear about the problem. Um, and um, about 76% said that they weren't fully evaluated by their health care providers, or pro and, and almost 85% uh, said that they weren't properly diagnosed, and, um, and uh, even almost 90% said that nobody followed up on their complaint when, uh, their, when a problem was brought up. So not surprisingly, um, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, still trying to get used to working the slides here. Let me try and advance to the next slide. There we go. Um, uh, it's, it's hard for, for us to have conversations with our providers. There's um, a bit of suspiciousness that our concerns aren't going to be taken seriously. And indeed, this is um, a, another study that basically says the same thing, that there's a uh, lack of confidence in providers, that providers, uh, that there's a high, that patients thought that providers were going to dismiss their concerns, or that if they did bring them up, 68% thought that the providers would be uncomfortable talking about sexual issues, or um, that there would be nothing that, that the healthcare provider could do about it. Um, and so uh, this kind of, um, these kinds of concerns, understandably, would make people be somewhat reluctant to um, bring up their concerns to their health care providers. Um, but I think it's also worth thinking about it from um, the other point of view, that is the health care provider's um, perspective. And so while um, patients are, are sort of thinking that health care providers don't want to talk about it or going to be uncomfortable talking about it. Um, uh, uh, Health care providers are also worried about bringing up sexual issues. That doesn't make it right. Um, we as health care providers should be properly trained in talking about um, sexual functioning and intimacy. But nevertheless, um, this is a survey showing that uh, almost 75% of health care providers um, thought that patients would be uh, reluctant or reticent or embarrassed to talk about uh, sexual uh, issues and therefore um, that interfered with their um, ability to bring up the issues in the context of, of a health care encounter. So there's, there's um, discomfort on both sides and you know I guess this just tells you that everybody's human um, but that doesn't get the problem solved because it doesn't get um, issues with sexual functioning addressed. Uh, and so the question is, um, what can be done about it? Well, the, the, the data show that um, patients are more likely to talk about sex when, not surprisingly, the healthcare provider initiates the, the discussion. And actually, Dr. Clayton showed you um, the slide where uh, there, were, uh, there was a fourfold increase in the number of sexual complaints when um, a survey was administered that systematically asked about sexual functioning rather than waiting for people to bring it up spontaneously. Um, but there are also provider attitudes that can facilitate this dialogue. So if the provider seems concerned about sexual well-being um, and if the, the, the clinician is professional and seems um, kind and understanding. And so, you know, the Part of the moral of the story is that um, we as doctors should do um, everything that we can to put patients at ease. So this is a cartoon I sort of say doctors should do almost everything they can. So the, the um, 
the cartoon says, many women are more at ease with a female doctor. That's why I'm wearing the wig. So maybe not everything. But um, you know, certainly it's, it's a healthcare provider's job to facilitate the conversation um, about uh, sex and intimacy uh, and help people um, to, to bring up problems when, when this is uh, an uncomfortable topic for, for, for many individuals. Um, but the truth of the matter is sometimes um, we, when, as patients, need to um, work on the other side of the equation and bring these issues up in the context of a clinical encounter. So um, this, slide, this uh, cartoon says, we're not here to talk about what I want for Christmas. We're here to talk about what you want for Christmas. Um, and so sometimes you just have to forge on ahead, even if the provider isn't doing what he or she is supposed to be doing and facilitating the discussion. Um, so what can you do to facilitate a dialogue about sex with your doctor? Um, it may not be easy uh, to, to bring it up um, just at the spur of the moment. So it's really helpful to think about it ahead of time before you have your appointment and make a list of your concerns or your questions um, about uh, sexual functioning and um, write them down so that you know what you want to bring up in uh, in your appointment. And um, it's sometimes helpful, uh, Dr. Uh, Clayton talked about the um, different stages of sexual functioning, to actually think about what kinds of problems you're having and where along that trajectory or along that process the problem is falling. So are you, are you having issues with desire? Um, are you having thoughts about having sex? Are you having fantasies? Are you interested in, in sex or masturbation? Or are you not interested at all? Have you just not been thinking about sex at all? Or maybe your desire is fine, but you're having trouble with arousal. You're not getting excited, or you're having trouble with er erections or lubrication. Um, or maybe that part of, of the cycle is fine, but you are having trouble with, with orgasm, that you can't reach orgasm, or you're ha achieving orgasm too quickly. Or maybe it's a context with, with, within which the, the, sexual, um, the, the sexual relationship is occurring. Maybe it's broader relationship issues that you want to talk about. So I think it's very useful to sort of categorize um, the issues that you're having so that you can be as clear as possible with your provider um, about what you want help with. Um, sometimes it's just hard to talk about this um, if you haven't um, had much experience literally using the language of sex with a stranger. So um, uh, as Dr. Clayton said, there can be parts of our cultural upbringing that um, are uh, more conservative or, or or restrictive with respect to sex, and that might make it hard to, you know, s simply say the the words arousal or, or erection or orgasm. And sometimes it's just helpful to practice it. So, um, if you have a partner that you're comfortable with, you can practice with him or her. Or if not, maybe just say your your sort of spiel in front of the mirror, just to just to, you know you know, get it, get it out there so that you don't, you're not saying it for the first time uh, with your provider, and sometimes that'll make it a little bit more comfortable. Um, you know, the other thing that's really important to do, uh, Dr. Clayton again talked about uh, the sexual side of sex of medications. Many of the medications that we prescribe for, um, for, for uh, depression and bipolar disorder and other psychiatric disorders have um, significant sexual side effects, and so um, your provider ought to be talking to you about them. But if if your doctor's not talking to you about them, you should ask. Um, just like you might ask uh, when when the doctor prescribes a medication for you, is this medication going to cause weight gain? Um, uh, is this medication going to be effective? How long is it going to take for it to to kick in? You should also be asking, is this going to be causing sexual side effects, or what can I expect? Uh, what kind of impact is this going to have on my sexual functioning? Um, and it's absolutely reasonable to ask, um, are there remedies for these sexual side effects? Can you help me with this? What else can we do? Are there other options? Um, and these are things that you are absolutely entitled to ask about. Um, the other thing that I think it's, you know, it's always useful to think about um, you know, the, the other person's experience. It is helpful for your doctor to sort of understand a little bit about 
the context of your sexual life um, because um, you know although um, sometimes uh, sex is a solitary experience and maybe you're talking about masturbation in many cases it's um, an experience that you're sharing with another individual and um, it's it's helpful for your provider to sort of understand that context so um, if you can provide some information about your your gender identity your your primary sexual orientation and sort of what your sex life is like. Are you partnered? Are you having multiple partners, et cetera? Um, and, and that might be, um, and that's usually useful in terms of uh, allowing your, your provider to be, um, uh, to, to give you as, as much uh, help as possible around uh, the concerns that you might have about your functioning. And finally, you know, sometimes if you are in a partnered relationship, it, it might be useful to bring your partner in to an appointment. Um, it's it's probably best to plan ahead and maybe ask your provider um, to schedule a, maybe a longer appointment. But um, that's uh, probably a good time to um, uh, to talk about uh, shared sexual dis uh, problems or uh, uh, broader relationship sh issues. And you might be able to get some suggestions from your provider about um, uh, about treatments that could be useful for both of you as a couple, or um, if you're focused on one member of the couple having difficulty, it often can be clarifying to get additional information from the partner. So um, that is also another strategy that you might consider. Um, I'm going to switch gear now uh, and continue uh, talking about conversations, but now talk about conversations that you might want to have with your partner. And um, I'm actually sort of aware of the irony here that this is a webinar. And I'm, uh, from my perspective here, I'm sort of talking into the void. I know you're out there somewhere. But um, th this is probably a terrible sort of role model for the kinds of conversations um, we all should be having about sex and intimacy. Um, telephone conversations, texting, social media, they are probably not the best way to be having conversations about um, these really important uh, uh, aspects of our lives. Um, these, these are conversations that really are best had face to face. Um, but nevertheless, we're doing a webinar here, so we'll, we'll keep going. Um, so uh, communication um, and sex really go hand in hand. So this is a, a cartoon that says, do nothing Congress, and you see two people not appearing to have sex, that's for sure, but they're also not not talking to each other. Um, and I think that that's often the case, that um, trouble with communication and uh, sex often go hand in hand. Um, and so um, what I'm going to do is run through a couple of, um, I, I guess I'll call them exercises. Um, and in fact, they come from uh, a book that was written by uh, David Miklowitz and Michael Goldstein uh, uh, are called uh, Family Focused Treatment for Bipolar Disorder. And again, these are things that really need to take place in face-to-face um, in -face communication. But we'll, we'll go through um, some of these different uh, strategies to enhance communication. So we'll talk about um, expressing positive feelings, engaging in active listening, making positive requests for change, and then um, expressing negative feelings in a constructive manner. OK, so how do we um, express positive feelings? So first of all, I just want to mention that it's important to express positive feelings. So sometimes when we're having difficulties in relationship, our inclination is, is just to talk about how frustrated we are and how angry we are. But it's really important to look for the positives as well and find time in our lives to express positive feelings. So the first thing to do um, is to really look at the other person. And I mean that for real. I mean like actually making eye contact um, and, and telling the the person what they did that actually pleased you and related to that how that made you feel so um, you took the garbage out tonight without my even asking you to do it that made me feel like you really care about me so 
um, linking their actions to uh, how you feel and um, saying it with gusto and uh, um, positive regard. Um, the other thing that's really important in communication is being a good listener. Um, and we sort of you know know that as a platitude, you know, be a good listener. You've heard that since you were in kindergarten. But how, how do we really do that? Again, this is a, a kind of a weird thing to do over a webinar, but um, y you know you want to um, use a lot of nonverbal uh, uh, physical cues to indicate that you're really engaged in listening to what the person is saying. So maybe all of you on the other end of this webinar are doing this as I'm talking, um, but I can't see you. So, um, but hopefully you're. You're, you're, you're listening intently, and if you if I could see you, you'd be looking at me, you'd um, be listening to what I'm saying, and you'd be nodding your heads, um, and maybe you'd be giving me some verbal cues as well, like uh-huh, or oh, or oh, okay, interesting, and then um, you might uh, ask some clarifying questions, so maybe I'll get some of that in the question uh, and answer period, and then check out what you've heard. So um, a good way to do that is reflect back um, what, you've just, what you've just been saying. So um, sort of a reframe of um, what the person has said. It um, allows you to communicate uh, that you were listening and that you actually got the gist of what they were saying without sort of parroting it back. So you might say, so it sounds like to be a good listener means um, giving feedback with both verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, it's important also in communication to be able to ask someone to do something. Um, and, you know, uh, and it might not just be asking someone to take out the garbage. It might be asking them um, to change the way they interact in um, an intimate uh, situation to um, to um, to show more physical um, uh, to to give you more physical contact to to help you out with something around the house whatever it is you want to ask for it's important to make those requests in a positive way so again you'll notice it begins the same way look at the person uh, um, eye contact is really important um, and then to state it in a really clear and direct way um, without a whole lot of drama. So instead of saying, if you don't take out that garbage, uh, I'm going to lock you out of the house and not make dinner for you, you just say real clearly, I would really like it if you would take out the garbage for me. And then you want to again link it to how you're feeling. Um, uh, if you would take out the garbage for me, it would really make me feel like you're helping me out around the house and it would help me feel um, supported. So again, you want to use I statements. I would really like it if you did this. It would make me feel um, feel uh, really, really understood and helped if you did that. Uh, I statements meaning talking about yourself rather than about the other person. Um, but sometimes uh, although we try to frame things in the positive, because I think that that helps uh, foster better communication and a better um, uh, positive regard for one another in the context of relationship, sometimes negative feelings have to be explored and expressed too, and that's absolutely part of positive. Positive. I don't want to use that word. It's actually it's it's part of um, constructive uh, communication in the context of relationship, um, and so. Uh, but it's important to think about how you're going to express those negative feelings. Um, you want to be clear and specific about what you're going to express, um, and um, and do it in a way that's constructive um, and not critical. So again, we're going to say, look at the person. The eye contact's important, um, and to speak firmly. Um, and you need to be very clear about what the person did that upset you um, and do it in a non-judgmental way. So um, again, you know, I really was upset that when you came home from, from uh, being away for three days, you didn't give me a hug or a kiss or 
any showed me any kind of sign of affection. Um, and when you did that, it made me feel unloved, like you didn't care for me. And then you might offer a suggestion about how to prevent this in the future. Uh, when you're away for a while, I really need some kind of affection when you come home to to really reconnect with you and 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 reestablish that we're together and we care for each other. So the idea here is to um, eliminate as much drama from the conversation as possible, but clearly state your needs um, and connect them to your feelings. Um, oh, having trouble changing the slides. Let's see. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, so the point of all of this is to try to um, facilitate communication with partners in order to improve uh, intimacy. Um, and this goes back to Dr. Clayton's point that, um, uh, that sex generally doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs in the context of our interpersonal relationships. Um, and uh, as our interpersonal functioning improves, um, so does so do our sexual relationships. And um, uh, even though there's a little telephone here, the idea is not to to have our communications by telephone. The idea is to um, improve our relationships and hopefully our our, our ability to have um, uh, close and meaningful sexual relationships. So the cartoon says, "Oh, baby, hot caramel, you're going to dip me in hot car caramel. I'll be right over." So that's a final parting, parting note. So thank you very much. I'll hand it back over to Cindy. Thank you both, Anita and Holly, for your presentation. We are going to continue now into the Q&A portion. But before we do, I really wanted to take an opportunity to cover a couple of closing items in case some of you would like to leave early. So on, in the PowerPoint handout, you will have a list of resources that we provided here. Um, that would be available to you. And also, uh, Dr. Clayton had mentioned the scales earlier. Um, those scales and some additional questionnaires that you might want to look at to be able to help facilitate those questions, those, those, that those discussions that Dr. Schwartz talked about with both your clinician and or your partner um, are available as handouts as well. Um, those can be located um, at dbsalliance.org slash webinars. The, um, this, this webinar is actually on there twice, and so if you're having a hard time right now finding those handouts, um, they are located underneath the archived portion of the uh, Restoring Intimacy. So you can locate them there, but we'll also have them up um, and consolidated very quickly. But they're on that page if you'd like to, to look at those. Um, again, the archived version of this particular taping will be up within the week on the same page. So dbsalliance.org slash forward webinars. And before we go into q and I really want to take an have an opportunity to say thank you for the time and expertise provided by our esteemed presenters, Dr. Anita Clayton and Dr. Holly Schwartz. We'd also like to thank Pfizer for their generous support for the production of this webinar. And we'd like to thank you, our peers and partners, for joining us to discuss this delicate but crucial component of living a thriving life. We hope you found the webinar informative and helpful and that you'll provide us feedback via a survey that will be emailed to you um, uh, tomorrow. And um, lastly, if you want to make sure that you uh, are able to attend future webinars and if you want more information on um, this webinar, you can go again to dbsalliance.org forward slash webinars. And also, we encourage you to sign up for our monthly e-update so that you can learn about uh, future webinars and all the programming that DBSA provides. So with that, I am going to take a little bit of a moment here and check some of the questions that have come in for us. If you haven't submitted a question at this point, I would encourage you to enter that question into the chat box, and we will um, we will proceed from there. So um, one of the questions um, that was brought up was um, why does abstinence occur during the manic phase of my bipolar disorder? Um, this person indicates they have absolutely no sex drive during that uh, phase. So if either Holly or Anita could address that, that would be great. 
well, I think what I would say is that it's hard to predict what might be excitatory and what might be inhibitory, especially when we're talking about something that might be an action on a cellular level or related to chemicals. And, and even though it might seem like it's predictive, it's probably not. So as much as you might be uh, interested in a lot of things and take having high-risk behaviors, uh, when uh, someone is manic, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would have a strong sex drive. So uh, that, that may be even more disturbing because it seems incongruent to the mood uh, if you're feeling euphoric. So don't have a great explanation except that there are a lot more inhibitory actions than we're aware of uh, on these cellular levels. All right. We also have another um, situation uh, that probably is more relationship-based that maybe, Holly, you might want to address. A um, person is concerned because um, when they try to initiate sex, their partner has said that they've, they don't have the drive because they have masturbated. And um, that makes that person concerned because they feel like that's been happening a lot and that that person would rather uh, self-pleasure than have sex with um, her. So um, she was just wondering what the action steps she might be able to take to probably either have a greater conversation and or correct the situation. Um, yeah, so this sounds like uh, a, a really important conversation to have with a partner. Um, and, uh, you know, again, the, the time to have that conversation is probably not when um, when she's just tried to initiate sex and feels rejected by her partner, um, but maybe to uh, ask her partner um, to have a conversation of, about the issue and their, their sexual relationship um, at a time when they can both have um, a, a calm and constructive conversation. Um, so to talk about the topic uh, you know, as, as a general issue in their relationship um, uh, rather than at the moment uh, of, of feeling rejected. Um, and, and again, you know, maybe, you know, sort of using some of the strategies outlined um, around uh, either expressing negative feelings about, uh, about this uh, issue or even making positive, uh, a positive request, which would be um, uh, asking her partner to um, uh, say, uh, saying that she would like to uh, have uh, sex more often, that that would be a way to feel closer to her partner, um, and uh, asking for uh, some suggestions on how, how to make that happen. Um, uh, and if they're not able to resolve it themselves, um, perhaps seeking an outside uh, a counselor to help them um, uh, work through that uh, more effectively. Thank you. Um, another audience member asked if there's any evidence that IU, an IUD affects overall mood and libido. Um, she states, I'm assuming it's a she, <laughs> that her doctor says it's unlikely, but that others have reported it kind of um, anecdotally. And just they, she was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, Anita, could you address that one? Sure. Um, so the most common IUD that people use now is the Mirena IUD, which uh, secretes progesterone. That's part of what it does. So not only does it, um, it's an implanted uh, foreign body, but it also secretes progesterone, which tends to lead to things like uh, not necessarily having a menstrual period and that kind of thing. Um, and the hormones really can influence people, although it's not totally clear how um, something that is absorbed through the vaginal wall or the uterine wall, um, whether that becomes systemic, that is, does it get to other parts of your system, like your brain. Um, whereas oral, oral medications, something you take in a pill form, does be, get through your entire system. So progesterone sometimes does influence uh, both sexual interest or receptivity by the partner, but also can influence mood and anxiety. So some people feel that um, they're, they're less anxious when they get progesterone, and some people feel more anxious. Um, and some people who take, for example, other progesterone kinds of uh, birth control also can sometimes have significant mood disturbances. For example, some of the 
shots um, that are also progesterone. So it could very well influence it, although I think that the risk generally would be low, um, but it is possible. I'm going to dovetail this on a second question that we had received um, prior to the uh, webinar starting, actually, about um, wondering how, Anita, antidepressants work against normal sexual dysfunction. The question was whether or not they mess up hormones such that hormone testing and or cautious medical supervised hormone therapy, um, if that would be appropriate. So it, it does appear that the ser serotonin really does a lot of things. And, and in many ways, it's inhibitory, especially related to sexual activity. And maybe that makes some sense from sort of a teleological or um, developmental in terms of over the years evolutionary kind of viewpoint. Um, but I think that uh, when we look at what antidepressants, for example, can do in terms of effects on hormones, they can, for example, regulate estrogen in women so that it might actually help people cycle more regularly. And if you cycle more regularly and you ovulate regularly, that is actually a positive in general in terms of sexual activity. On the flip side of that, though, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors can lower uh, levels of testosterone. In particular, we mean free testosterone because that's the part that's involved in, um, in our being able to use the testosterone and, for example, might influ influence sexual desire. So women's levels of testosterone are low to start with by comparison to men. So if that was reduced, it might not take a very big reduction to have a significant impact. On the other hand, because testosterone levels are low, even if it was reduced somewhat, it, that might not make that much difference in a woman. For a man, his testosterone levels tend to be higher, and um, if those levels are lowered by a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, for example, then that might impact significantly on his desire. And for men, that effect continues on through arousal and orgasm as well. So. Hormones can be impacted by neurotransmitters, and the flip side is true, too, that uh, hormones can influence neurotransmitters. Great. Um, and Holly, there's an interesting one, considering your background on this. Someone, and someone brings up the thought that, the, or the uh, observation that they found living life on a fairly regular scale, uh, schedule to be helpful and was wondering if that could be applied to this situation as well. I um, was looking for your opinion on scheduling regular time for sex and intimacy. Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. You know, I think that, you know, there are um, many aspects of our lives that are regulated by circadian function and you know um, I'm a, you know there's a good deal of evidence that um, in uh, certainly in bipolar disorder and in in depression that increased regularity of circadian rhythms contributes to increased stability of mood and so um, pretty much anything that you can do to um, improve the regularity of routines um, is uh, likely to uh, help with um, mood stability. Now, um, whether um, increased regularity of um, uh, or having sex at the same time every day is likely to help with sexual functioning, that I'm not so sure about. Um, uh, I, uh, that would that 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 I hmm, oh, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of a mechanism by which that would that would happen. But um, but I do think that having um, sex at, at a regular time of the day um, would probably be another cue to your body um, about uh, the where it falls in the 24 25 hour um, circadian cycle and help to keep uh, your rhythms on track, which. Um, in the long run will uh, contribute to your overall well-being. So um, that, that's probably a good thing. 
I'm going to put the next one out to either uh, Anita or Holly. Um, there's a question that says, how can you curb stress and anxiety to focus more on your partner's needs for intimacy and or I would guess your own? You know, one thing that you can do is have a healthy lifestyle. I mentioned that before. People tend to feel better. They tend, uh, and that is emotionally better as well as physically better. Um, when they're lead, leading a healthier lifestyle, so that, that can be helpful. I do think um, communication is very important. And talking about scheduled sex, that that's, you know, generally, if we look at sort of the mean, most of us have sex about once a week. So it's probably occurring <laughs> sort of on the same day anyway. But if we're over overstressed, we've got a lot going on and we feel like we have to accomplish all kinds of things and like I said, we maybe put sex lower on the priority list. If you have it scheduled, for example, then that might in fact let you, um, it would keep you from pushing it down, pushing it away, lowering the priority and skipping it all together. And those might be something that would also improve uh, your relationship with your partner. I think talking with your partner about what you're experiencing can be helpful. Um, talking about what you what you like, what you want, especially if there's been some change uh, that's getting in the way. Um, for example, your diabetes gets out of control and that's causing a problem related to um, lubrication or erection, then being able to talk about what the two of you can do together or how you might pleasure each other in other ways might also be helpful. So I think I think communication is really important and it's not always just about um, just about the sex. It might also be setting up those times to talk with each other or and or setting up those times to actually have sex uh, might go a long way toward improving your sexual satisfaction and your partners. Thanks. We have a, a question that comes from, I believe, a partner that's talking about um, the impact of weight gain from medications um, on his partner's self-esteem. And so I think he was looking for some advice related to some practical um, maybe some pharmacological solutions and or perhaps there's some uh, so, um, psychosocial interventions that might be helpful for them as a couple. So if you could uh, address either of those things, that would be great. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the partner who's asking the question um, is al already, I think, showing, showing concern is, is probably um, a really helpful first step and perhaps um, communicating in a non-judgmental way to um, his or her partner that um, that that uh, that they recognize that this is a side effect of medication and um, that the medications are to blame rather than the person um, is uh, a helpful first step in terms of um, helping clear up at least uh, the way the partner sees what's happening. Um, that, of course, doesn't uh, address the person who's gained the weight's experience of it and their own uh, self-esteem issues, um, but that um, uh, it, it's important for the, the person who's gained weight to feel accepted in the context of the relationship. Um, then, of course, if um, weight gain is an issue the, 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 um, and it's because of medication, it's important to be able to address that with a healthcare provider to talk about um, whether there might be alternative to the medication that's caused weight gain um, uh, and to talk about um, lifestyle interventions um, that might be able to uh, help with uh, weight gain uh, if that medication is necessary to um, for for health and, and well-being. Um, and if the partner's supportive that that's something that they might be able to do together to make those lifestyle changes together to incorporate um, more exercise together, um, healthy um, eating changes together, um, and if it's seen as a joint project, uh, that's something that might bring the two of them together. 
Okay, thank you. Um, interesting question related to medications, and maybe I'd throw this one out to Anita. Um, there's a question about whether or not erectile dysfunction medications affect mental health health medications. So um, I'm assuming they're talking about PD-5 inhibitors like um, sildenafil, which is Viagra, or uh, one of the others, Vardenafil, um, Cialis, Levitra, et cetera. Um, those drugs actually don't cross the blood-brain barrier, so they don't get into your brain. So the effects of medicines for depression um, or other psychiatric illnesses get in the brain. That's how they're really working. And these drugs don't actually get in the brain. So for example, those kinds of medicines might help an erection or arousal and subsequently orgasm, but they don't really make a change, at least not a direct change related to sexual desire. Do they have drug-drug interactions, for example, with other medications? Um, there don't appear to be a lot of those except the ones that are uh, related to the warnings on those drugs with uh, nitrates, and um, those are just other kinds of medicines, cardiac medicines need to be avoided. But we use, um, for example, drugs like sildenafil or Viagra in combination with a number of um, psychotropic medications like antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, mood stabilizers, um, when people are experiencing arousal phase problems. And um, they, the only real issue has to do with the fact that, you, you know, it's cost because you're paying for another pill and those are not cheap medications. Um, and the other thing is the potential additional side effects, more so than drug interactions. Um, we have another question about a person that lives with bipolar disorder that is on uh, medication, and they were curious as to, um, they go through periods of really quite active sexual periods, and then also to periods of like complete um, drought of sexual activity and or desire. And they were wondering if they, you felt that the, the cyclical part of that would be more due to the nature of the medication or to the nature of the condition? Well, well you know, I, go, Holly. Okay, well, um, I mean, it would certainly be worth, um, you know, trying to track um, both of those things. So track um, sexual activity with mood and energy um, and medicines and see if there are changes in medications um, that are related to changes in sexual um, interest. But assuming that there aren't um, changes in medication, uh, it's clear that uh, that part of bipolar disorder involves um, fluctuating levels of energy and interest. Um, typically related to mood states. So, um, uh, you know, I think that, that that's not an uncommon experience, um, that when energy and interest are high, uh, sexual um, interest is also higher, and um, that's, you know, typically um, more in the manic phase, although as one of the questions earlier um, uh, indicated, that's not true for everybody. Um, but that is the more typical pattern. Um, and then conversely, during the depressed phase, when energy and interest are low, sexual interest drops as well. So um, you know, that's, that's not an uncommon pattern. And it, and it might speak to um, needing you know, maybe a better control of sort of mood cycling overall um, to kind of level, level things out if it's accompanied by other changes as well. I'd say one other thing about that, because I don't know if this is uh, related to a man or a woman, but if it's related to a reproductive age woman, uh, you might see some changes like that across the menstrual cycle. Uh, it does seem that uh, various fluctuations in hormones lead to an increased interest in sex uh, around the time of ovulation. And again, that sort of makes sense from this teleological or, or evolutionary point of view that in the past uh, it, it was helpful to get pregnant whenever you had sex. And so setting it up so that you have sex when you're most likely to get pregnant, that you want to have sex then, it's more pleasurable, things like that around the time of ovulation. Not that we're consciously aware of it, but more um, 
unconscious biologic drives, then that that might explain it. So if you're on birth control pills, that might reduce some of that, or um, triphasic birth control, that is the kind of birth control that changes across the cycle, might still continue that to some degree better than one that just keeps a constant level of um, hormone going. So if this is problematic, and it appears related to the menstrual cycle, then being on a hormonal contraceptive that uh, is steady might be helpful to you. If, if you see it as desirable to have these increased phases, then not being on an oral contraceptive or being on one that does fluctuate across the cycle might improve the situation. If you're, if it's coming from a man, this question, then it, what I just said probably has nothing to do with it. Um, we also have an individual that shared that they had dealt with um, abuse and therefore had put sex off for a couple of years and was interested in knowing how they might introduce sex back into their life. I would say safety is, is the biggest issue so that trusting someone, um, talking with them about it, uh, working your way up to it, having a plan about it, um, stopping and backing off and coming back to it if a problem exists related to that. Um, but I do think that it, it partnered sex in, in that circumstance. It's important that uh, you can pace yourself as you feel comfortable and that your partner understands that. Thank you. Um, another person asked, um, related to communication, how uh, the partner could express their needs, their personal needs, without pressuring the, the person who's experiencing the sexual dysfunction. Um, you know, I think that, um, again, w one of the important messages is, is not to have these conversations at the moment when you're wanting to have sex or trying to have sex. So um, uh, that's really too loaded a moment to have these kinds of conversations. So uh, it's important to set up a, a time um, that's comfortable for both parties to actually sit down and have a conversation um, about uh, uh, who wants what. Um, and um, you know, it's not uncommon for for um, members of um, uh, both, you know, two, two, two partners to disagree about many different things, including sex. Um, but what's important is to, uh, for both people to be able to uh, lay out what their expectations and their desires are, um, and then to begin to try to negotiate. And um, uh, it's important to set it up so that both both partners feel like they have an equal voice in um, what the ultimate resolution will be. So if one person has more desire than the other, um, if one person's having some, um, difficulties with sexual functioning, that um, both both partners understand where the other person is coming from, um, and perhaps uh, and, and inevitably there's going to be some negotiation that goes on, um, so that both. Uh, partners feel respected and, and understood and um, recognize that it's going to be a process of, of sort of gradually um, coming to a place where, the, where, where they can meet in, in the middle. Uh, but it's through a process of talking. There's another interesting question that was brought up. Um, if, if both people in a couple have therapists, is it best to get another or a third therapist to work with the couple on the sexual issues? I would say that sometimes that is, is beneficial because often people will feel like it's, it's my partner's therapist and so they're siding with them. Um, and that's true sometimes in couples therapy that's not specifically related to um, difficulties in, um, in, with intimacy. So it, it probably depends on the individuals and it probably depends on the therapist, but that might in fact be uh, something to consider if um, if people are concerned that they, you know it's their fault or that they're going to be blamed or um, 
you know, they, they are easily overwhelmed, those kinds of things might make a difference there. I think that that's a decision that, that the two people involved need to make. And their therapist may have some input in that as well. Yeah, I mean, I agree um, with Anita. Um, I, you know, the, the one issue is if you're specifically looking for sex therapy, which is, um, you, know, a, a, you know, a particular expertise um, that can be hard to find. I think that sometimes, you know, if, you know, you only can find you know, one therapist who happens to have that training, you know, sometimes you, you make accommodations, um, you know, to get the kind of treatment that, that you need. Okay, and we have another person that has submitted a question about anxiety. Um, their partner lives with anxiety and they were interested in trying to get some in advice on how they could encourage that person to be more affectionate throughout the day as opposed to just strictly when trying to initiate sex. Well, you know, that's, um, you know, as I'm hearing that question, I'm, um, I'm wondering how the two are connected because, you know, whether the person has anxiety or not, you know, that might be a reasonable request. Um, that somebody would make of, of a partner. So, you know, again, I think it comes down to, um, you know, asking the partner to have a conversation. And again, I've, so I think I've said it a lot of times, but not doing it the moment when you're trying to have sex, but finding a, another time to have this conversation and, and making that, you know, particular request. So, you know, to say, you know, it, I'd really, you know, um, it would be really uh, important to me if we can have more um, more contact, more physical contact, and show affection to each other um, throughout the day, not just when we're um, about to have sex. Um, that would make me feel much more more connected to you and, and initiate the conversation that way. Um, if anxiety is getting in the way of, of that that kind of physical connection, it would probably be worth. Um, trying to understand how, how that's happening um, and uh, you know you as a partner are not responsible for treating your partner's anxiety and so you know, part of the conversation might be um, uh, uh, talking about uh, the treatment that the person's getting for their anxiety and how that's going and again you know negotiating so if the person's you know getting treatment for anxiety and they're working on it but they're not there yet um, you know, being respectful of the fact that treatment's ongoing and, and coming up with some kind of um, intermediate goal. Maybe uh, uh, it, it won't be um, showing affection throughout the day, but maybe there could be one other point during the day where there's a moment for connection um, with the goal that that might increase um, in frequency as the anxiety diminishes. But again, this is going to be a process of negotiation and being respectful of each other's needs and taking time to have a conversation where everybody puts their needs uh, on the table. I think one other thing along those lines is that some people um, see any, any, any demonstration of affection, so a, a quick hug or a kiss or something like that, as being an indicator that they want to participate in sexual activity. And if the person is anxious about participating in sex, um, then they might want to avoid it. Or if their sexual desire is very low, they might want to avoid sex and become anxious when their partner is approaching them for sex. And so if you really want uh, more affection without necessarily it leading to sex, during the day, then, and this is an issue, then perhaps specifically stating we're not going to, we won't try to go forward and do anything more. This is um, for a connection for us that is not on uh, the same level of intimacy that sex is, but it still is emotionally intimate and, and appreciated. So again, having that conversation separate from that. Um, to find out if the person is anxious that that means, a kiss means we're going to have sex or not and, and the anxiety around that, that could be changed and again each saying yes we'll go along with this uh, because it will each get something out of it um, and but we'll limit it to, to this kind of interaction. 
I want to thank everyone for their wonderful uh, questions. And I want to like to thank, again, our presenters, Dr. Anita Clayton and Dr. Holly Schwartz, as well as our webinar sponsor, Pfizer, and, and our audience for your support and participation in DBSA's Restoring Intimacy webinar. I just wanted to leave one final reminder for more information about this or future webinars. Again, please visit www.dbsalliance.org slash webinars. So thank you, everyone, and have a great evening.